All right, why don't we get started? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are excited to host a debate between two brilliant minds in the fields of philosophy and neuroscience. Dr. Michael Humer is a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado. He is the author of more than 70 academic articles in epistemology, ethics, metaethics, metaphysics, and political philosophy, as well as eight amazing books that you should immediately buy. Dr. Robert Sapolsky is an American neuroendocrinology researcher and author. He is a professor of biology, neurology, neurological sciences, and neurosurgery at Stanford University. In addition, he is a research associate at the National Museums of Kenya. Our format for tonight's debate will be minimally moderated, featuring a 10-minute opening statement from each speaker, followed by a five to seven minute rebuttal period for each speaker. After that, we will have an open discussion for 20 to 25 minutes, followed by a Q&A session for the last 10 to 15. We believe that this format will allow for a deep exploration of the topic, and I hope that it will shed light on, some, uh, on this age-old debate. All right, and with that, why don't we get into our uh, and first 10 minute opening statement from the speaker against the conventional wisdom that free will exists and is important. I believe that would be Dr. Robert Spolsky. This is the first debate I've ever been in in my life. I managed not to get in debate club in high school. Um, so this seems like an ideal way to start off because I could not imagine a starker contrast in views about the world between me and Mike. Um, basically, I think the world is entirely deterministic, and we can talk about quantum indeterminacy somewhere along the way, but I think it is deterministic enough that there's no free will. Mike, meanwhile, if I can, like, turn you into a sound bite to match mine, I believe you believe that uh, there is no, the world is not meaningfully deterministic, and that we have free will. So we've, we've got a nice contrast here, I think. Okay, so the logical thing from my end is to start off, what do I mean by determinism? And using sort of a, a somewhat classical version, um, something happens, and we ask, why did that happen? And recently, scientists, and by recently, I mean in the last 500 years or so, recently scientists have figured out the answer. This just happened because of what came before. And that happened because of what came before that and what came before that. And it's causality all the way down. And again, we can talk about the weird domain of quantum indeterminacy, which is an exception to that, and why I don't think it's relevant to free will. Okay, so this happened because of what came before, and the, let's translate that into the realm that we care about instead of like asteroids or something, um, which is someone does a behavior, and it's wonderful and compassionate, it's horrible and appalling, it's ambiguous in between, it's in the eye of the beholder, whatever, and we ask the classic human question, why did that person just do what they did? And one possible answer is because they just exercised free will. And what I would contend, and going through a whole series of steps with it, is they did what they did because of what came before, and what came before that and came before that. Okay, let me, let me translate this into the world that's sort of meaningful to us mammals and things like that. Part of why you made the decision you did had something to do with what was going on in the seconds before that. Amazing finding, take people, stick them in a room with smelly garbage, and they don't know what's there, but smelly garbage, and on the average, people become more homophobic. And they will explain to you exactly the reason for their stance, and it's the smell in the room. Put somebody in a room where it smells of fresh chocolate chip cookies, they are more generous in economic games. So that's influencing a decision that we would otherwise have said was about free will. How about minutes before? Oh, no, the dogs. How about in the minutes before what's happened there? That's going to be relevant also. Minutes like how long has it been since you've eaten a meal? One classic study showing the single best predictor of whether judges are going to make a judgment in favor of defendants is a function of how long has it been since they've eaten a meal. The longer it's been, 
the less open they are to an argument in favor of the defendant. And that has since been shown the longer since a meal, the more likely you are to turn down somebody's loan application if you're a bank executive, the less likely you are to spend time looking at somebody's CV before deciding not to hire them. So those were influences in the minutes before. How about in the hours to days before? And that's talking about hormone levels and some amazing stuff. If, for example, someone has altered your levels of a hormone called oxytocin and raised that levels, you are now more likely to cheat to help out teammates in some sort of competitive setting. Otherwise, you wouldn't do that. Wow, why did you cut that corner? And here's my rational, free willish explanation. And part of it is instead because your hormone levels had something to do with it. But how about instead in the weeks to months to years before, and suppose you're a cop and you've gone through some sort of trauma in the past and you have PTSD. And as a result, your brain works differently. A structure in your brain called, called the amygdala has changed its function. And we can even describe down to the level of molecules how that has happened. And as a result of that, you look at somebody who is holding a cell phone and in under a tenth of a second, your amygdala is more likely to decide that that's actually a handgun and you pull the trigger. And we all know the relevance of that to everyday life. Okay, so I just freely decided that looked like a handgun and decided to shoot. PTSD will change that. All sorts of other sort of implicit cues will change that as well. But it's not just like years to decades ago. Go back to childhood. Childhood, how much adversity were you exposed to? People in the child development literature refer to these things called ACE scores, adverse childhood experiences. And you can get an official ACE score. Were you exposed to psychological trauma? Were you exposed to physical trauma? Were you exposed to sexual trauma? Did you observe it in your home? Was there somebody incarcerated in the family? A whole checklist. And you get your ACE score. And amazingly, for every step higher in your bad news ACE score, you have about a 35% increased likelihood of antisocial aggression by the time you're in your 20s, if you're a male, and about a 35% increased likelihood, if you're a female, of a teenage pregnancy. Having nothing to do with your decisions whether or not to stick up the liquor store or not, but the sort of brain that was constructed in your childhood by how adverse your environment was. But we can push it even further back. You've just made a decision, which you attribute to the free will, and part of what occurred instead was your fetal life. What happened when you were a fetus? If your mother was highly stressed during your fetal life, and thus you were exposed to high levels of her stress hormones, that's going to change the functioning of your brain in adulthood, having all sorts of things to do with how readily you see threat, how prone you are to anxiety a finding that should have people rioting at the barricades. It's so outrageous. Um, Technicking, imaging techniques have gotten to the point where you could image a fetal brain. And by the time you're a third trimester fetus, the socioeconomic status of your parents, of your mother, is already influencing the size of your brain. But even further back, genes, genes don't determine anything, but genes modulate circumstance. Here's a totally cool one. There's a gene having to do with the vasopressin receptor. And if you have one particular version of it, it doesn't change male behavior normally. But if you are in a stable monogamous relationship, it makes you decrease the distance that you stand between you and someone else who seems sexually attractive. You stop remembering that you're in a monogamous relationship. You're more likely to do that. But further back, culture, culture like two generations ago, in China, half the country are rice farmers and develop collectivist cultures. Half are wheat farmers and develop individualist cultures. And if your grandparents were from either of those backgrounds, that influences the likelihood of you having invented something and filing for a patent. 
you having gotten a divorce or remain steadily in a relationship for your whole lifetime. But further back than two generations, look at somebody now and they make a decision where we would assess how xenophobic are they being about immigrants. And part of what goes into it is 400 years ago, what was the infectious disease load of their culture? Because if they descended from those people who had to worry about how infectious outsiders were, they've created, and you were raised in, a culture that was more xenophobic. But it goes even further back. How about 50,000 years? This amazing feature that has been found in indigenous populations all over Earth, which is the further your ancestors migrated from Africa, the more likely you are to have a gene variant related to novelty seeking. I mean, at some point, 50,000 years ago, a bunch of people got to Siberia and said, this looks cool, great place to raise kids. And others said, wow, look at that. There's a land bridge. Let's see what Alaska is about. And 50,000 years later, that's reflected in differences in gene frequencies. So why did the person do what they did that they might attribute to free will? Because of what came a second before and an hour before and a million years and everything in between. Now, the critical reason why this doesn't free will harps to something that Mike has brought up, which is like a wonderful word. He he has like appropriately condemned behaviorists, 20th century behaviorists, by saying that they were overconfident in describing like how they could explain everything. And that was a very polite term. They were over, do not trust anyone who says this gene explains everything or this part of the brain explains everything or this hormone or this cultural feature, anything. Don't believe them because they're not going to explain anything with that. And that's not how you disprove free will. And it's not even that put all these disciplines together and you plug all the holes. They're not all different disciplines. They're all the same discipline. If you were talking about genes, by definition, you're talking about evolution. And you're talking about the proteins those genes code for and how they constructed your brain this morning. If you were talking about fetal life, you were talking about how your pregnant mother was treated in her culture that produced her stress hormone levels and thus what sort of brain you would have as an adult. And I think when you put all these pieces together just to be like really subtle and not in your face, I think the result is there is no room. It is a seamless arc of biological influences interacting with environmental influences that leave no room for free will whatsoever. So that's, that's my like song and dance. Our, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Spolsky for that terrific opening statement. We'll now move into a 10 minute opening statement from uh, Dr. Humor arguing in favor of the motion free will exists and it matters. Dr. Humor. Great, thanks. So I'm going to try and share this slideshow that I have, um, but I haven't done this before, so I'm not totally sure. Uh, share screen. Let's see. Wait, that doesn't look right. Um, hold on, I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, okay, so do you is do you see the share button at the bottom? Did you try yes. that? Yes. Okay. Did you then choose I went, screen? I went to window, but none of the windows look like the um, presentations window. Oh. Okay. Um, I don't know what these things are. Wait, let me see. Uh, okay. There's entire screen. I could try that, but oh, but it won't let me. It won't let me do it. That's odd. You could try emailing it to me, and I could see if it works from my end. Let me see. Okay. Your screen. All right, hold on a second. I'm gonna try to email it to you. In a second. Okay. 
Okay, so it looks like screen sharing works on my end. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, uh, wait, okay, I can share this. Um, I have a PDF version of it. Okay, I don't, for some reason I can't share the um, um, oh, there you go. presentation version, but I can share a PDF. So, okay, so Terrific. that's what okay. All right, I'll start your time when you start speaking. Okay, good. So uh, thanks to Robert Tobolsky for uh, for that interesting opening st statement. I'm not going to respond to what he said right now because, you know, I have my own um, little presentation that I prepared. So, okay, so this is my understanding of the issue. The free will thesis holds that we sometimes have alternative possibilities available to us, and it is up to us which is realized. So meaning that... Um, you know, there's more than one thing that you can do, and you have control over what you do. Hard determinism, which, so I will, I will refer to this as determinism. Uh, philosophers distinguish between hard and soft determinism, but I'm not going to talk about soft determinism uh, because it's not Sapolsky's view. So hard determinism is a view that there's only ever one possibility, which is determined by the laws of nature and the initial conditions of whatever system we're talking about. And so um, a person doesn't have multiple things that they can do. Okay, so I'm going to argue that hard determinism is insane, and also it's self-defeating. And what I mean by it being insane is basically that it conflicts with the entire rest of your belief system, and it conflicts with um, the practices of any normal person in everyday life. Okay, and why do I say this? Um, you know, first to note is the existence of alternative possibilities is conceptually tied to many other kinds of judgments that we make. So whenever you say that a person should do something, it seems like you're presupposing that they have more than one alternative. Or if you try to give a reason for doing something, if you say that there's reason to do something, then it seems like you're also assuming that there's more than one thing that could be done. Uh, if you talk about somebody acting rightly or wrongly, also seems to presuppose that there are alternatives. Uh, also, people's, uh, so that's about people's judgments about these things, but also there are people's emotional reactions. So there are these reactive attitudes, as philosophers call them. Uh, if you feel pride, remorse, guilt, blame, praise, or gratitude for any action, that anybody does, then it seems like you're presupposing that people are responsible for their actions. Uh, and that would not be true if there's no free will. I note that my claim here is not that it's impossible to have these attitudes if hard determinism is true, but that if hard determinism is true, these attitudes would be inapt or they would involve you in making some kind of mistake. So in other words, the person who's having these attitudes is assuming that determinism isn't true. Okay, um, these are some practices that we have that wouldn't make sense if there's no free will. So it wouldn't make sense to reward anybody for anything or to punish anyone retributively for anything. It also wouldn't make sense to ever deliberate about what to do. If you're deliberating about what to do, then you're presupposing that you have alternatives and that it's up to you which one is realized. It wouldn't make sense to give people advice. It doesn't make sense to advise somebody to do something that they can't do but it also doesn't make sense to advise somebody to do something that they can't avoid doing. If determinism is true, everything is something that you either can't do or can't avoid doing, so it doesn't make sense to ever give anybody advice about anything. Uh, also, it doesn't make sense to evaluate actions. Now, previously, I mentioned that it doesn't make sense to say things are right or wrong, but you can't even evaluate things prudentially or in any other respect because there's only ever one alternative, so it doesn't make sense to talk about, like, what what alternative should be done from any um, perspective if there's only one alternative. And uh, just doing things for any reason doesn't make any sense. Because again, you can't have reasons for doing something if you don't have any alternatives available. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna uh, explain why I claim that determinism is self-defeating. I'm not the first person to come up with this idea. So this was said by Epicurus, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher, he said, the man who says that all things come to pass by necessity cannot criticize one who denies that all things come to pass by necessity, for he admits that this too happens of necessity. So the idea being that you can't, the determinist can't criticize a free will believer because on the determinist view, you know, the free will believer just can't help believing in free will. 
And then this is from the 20th century British philosopher J.R. Lucas. He says, determinism cannot be true because if it was, we should not take the determinist arguments as being really arguments, but as being only conditioned reflexes. Their statements should not be regarded as really claiming to be true, but only as seeking to cause us to respond in some way desired by them. All right, so these are previous people who thought that determinism was self-defeating. And by the way, this is not my argument. My argument is to follow, but I am also claiming that determinism is self-defeating in the ways to be explained on the following slides. So, okay, so first, the problem with deliberation. So uh, deciding what to believe about free will and determinism itself is a form of deliberation. But as I previously said on a previous slide, deliberation presupposes free will. It doesn't make sense to deliberate about what to do if there aren't alternatives or if what, which alternative is realized isn't up to you, right? And so uh, that means that just in the process of deciding what to believe about this very issue, you could not coherently decide to accept determinism, right? You couldn't do that coherently in the sense that you would have to presuppose that determinism is false in coming to decide to believe it, determinism. Okay, here's the problem about argumentation. Um, arguments are attempts to supply reasons for believing something. But as I previously claimed, if determinism is true, then there are no reasons for anything whatsoever. There can't be a reason to do A if you can't do A, and there also can't be reason to do A if you can't avoid doing A. So any argument for determinism is self-defeating. So I think of a, um, there's a interesting um, Star Trek episode in which um, there's this alien species called the Q, and one of the Q is on board the Enterprise. And at the time, the Enterprise is trying to deal with this problem where a, a moon is about to crash into an inhabited planet. And so they ask Q for advice, and Q says, well, just change the gravitational constant of the universe. Okay, and then uh, Commander Data has to explain that they can't do that. And now imagine that Q said, well, I know you can't do it, but you know, you should still do it anyway. Okay, that does not make sense, right? It's not true that they should change the gravitational constant anyway um, because they can't do it. And it's also not true that they have good reason or the most reason to change the gravitational constant. That's not what they have reason to do, right? They have reason to do the things that they can do. All right. So, okay, so determinism makes nonsense of arguments. It doesn't make sense to try to give reasons for anything if you think that um, there are no alternatives. So it doesn't make sense to argue for determinism. Okay, now the rationality problem. Uh, rational thinking, I claim, presupposes certain norms. So if you're trying to figure out what to believe and you're trying to figure out what's true, you're presupposing that truth should be preferred to error. And you're presupposing, if you're giving arguments and receiving arguments, you're presupposing things like that we should base our beliefs on the evidence, right? And there's a series of other norms about rational discourse, like you shouldn't contradict yourself and so on. But if determinism is true, then nobody ever should do anything because everything is either impossible or unavoidable. And it doesn't really make sense to think that you should do something if you can't do it or if you can't avoid doing it. So thus, you can't rationally believe in determinism. All right, so, you know, that's my concluding thought. Hard determinism is both insane and self-defeating. Uh, I have a paper about this, which you can find on my website. So I put the, uh, I put the address there. All right, that's all. Okay, and with that, we have Dr. Humer's opening statement in favor of the existence and significance of free will. Uh, we'll now move to a five to seven minute rebuttal period. Each speaker will be allotted that much time for uninterrupted engagement with the, op with the opposition. Uh, that begins with Dr. Sapolsky. Dr. Sapolsky, you can now rebut Dr. Humer for as many as seven minutes. Okay, um, well, Obviously, whatever I say should be taken with a grain of salt, since I am a madman. <laughs> so I love being characterized as insane, so that's wonderful. Um, and I certainly have the potential to be self-defeating in the next seven minutes. It seems like there's a couple of threads that are running through Mike's thinking. 
Um, the first one is an enormous emphasis on intuition. It wouldn't make sense, was one of the phrases. We feel that free will has to be true uh, because it wouldn't make sense. We feel pride. We feel lame. We feel because of our belief system. And we see that we have just decided to point our finger at the strawberry ice cream instead of the chocolate ice cream because we have just made a decision intuitively that feels exactly like that. And I think one of the key things that the last thousand years have taught us is to be very, very suspicious of our intuitions. Let me give you an example. 800 years ago, if there was a hailstorm, people had a very solid intuition as to why a hailstorm came in the middle of the summer and destroyed their crops. It's because the old woman down the street there in that house is a witch. And the way you keep that from happening again is to burn her to death. 500 years ago, if somebody had an epileptic seizure, it made sense. It seemed intuitively obvious to everyone from a peasant to the king that this had happened because the person was demonically possessed. 50 years ago, if you had a child with schizophrenia and you took that child to the best experts in the universe and asked them, why, why did they get this disease? There was an intuitively obvious answer, which is the one that dominated psychodynamic therapy for the first half of the century, which is you caused it. You were a horrible, hateful mother with ambivalent feelings about your child. You were a, quote, schizophrenogenic mother. And that seemed obvious, intuitively obvious. And 20 years ago, if you are a teacher and you see here's this third grader who simply is not learning how to read and they keep reversing their letters and all of that, you've got an intuitively obvious one. They're lazy. They're not motivated. They're not trying very hard. And what these last thousand years plus or minus a few millennia have been about is learning that intuitionism is not often or not always um, the way to go. People figured out that hailstorms was due to some gravitational difference in earth that called the, caused the little ice age. People figured out that, oh, this person had a seizure, not because they're, they're sleeping with Satan, but because they've got screwed up potassium channels in one part of their brain. People learned that no, mothers do not cause schizophrenia in their children because they had ambivalent feelings of loving and hating them and that produced toxic mothering. People, it's a neurogenetic developmental disorder that people are now working the details out. People have learned that kid who keeps reversing letters is not lazy. They've got some cortical malformations in one part of their brain, which we call dyslexia. What these last thousand years have been about is saying, yeah, it seems intuitively obvious that the sun rotates around Earth. And it seems intuitively obvious that the world is flat, flat. And it seems intuitively obvious that some people are so inferior to us that they deserve to be made slaves and kept in slavery for generations. And it seems intuitively obvious that women can't be trust, trusted being allowed to vote. And intuition is a pretty scary litmus test for how things work. Because every time you sit down someone and you do a classic social psych experiment, you ask them, what's your favorite detergent? And it turns out, if in the room there's a picture of the ocean, the person becomes more likely to say, Tide. Tide is my favorite detergent. And you say, oh, explain that to me rationally. And they will tell you why. And they will never have a clue that their intuition, that they decided in that moment that's their favorite whatever, that that caused it. And this is not to say that that picture caused that behavior. No single gene, no whatever, no, you, you can't say that because the janitorial staff 
didn't clear the trash out of somebody's office and it smelled terrible. And as a result, he decided to invade Ukraine and Ukraine and slaughter 100,000 like civilians. You can't say there's a genetic variant that made you break the law 34 times to pay off a, a porn star sort of thing. No single causal thing, but nonetheless, collectively, it shows you that intuition is not a very good guide for making sense of human behavior and the nature of the world because it's been a pretty lousy one over and over. Maybe as a final point, another thing that Mike emphasized is what I see to be a frequent problem in people who attack hard incompatibilists who say this free will or whatever, which is the sense that if you believe that, that that's how the world works, nothing can change. Everything is already predetermined. The philosopher John Searles has a hysterical way of framing it, that if I'm in the restaurant and the waiter comes over and says, what would you like for dinner? And he says, well, I'm a hard incompatibilist, so I'll just sit back and wait and see what my brain orders. I mean, that's, that's in a sense, it's sort of uh, catching that tone. Um, predeterminism, there's no possibility of change. That ended with Puritans deciding that God decided whether or not they like did something during winter and got a scarlet letter sewed on them or whatever. Um, lack of free will is completely compatible with change. And we understand the mechanistic bases by which a sea slug gets conditioned to retract its tail in response to a shock and the mechanistic conditions by which somebody decides that a them who didn't used to be scary seems scary now in under a fraction of a second, change happens with the final critical point. Mike is absolutely right. We do not choose to change. We are changed and we are changed in mechanistic ways that don't rely on free will. Okay, now we can have a rebuttal from Dr. Humer. You have uh, seven minutes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so, I mean, I'm gonna start by talking about um, Robert's opening statement. So it seemed to me like um, there, was a, there was a type of argument, so there were several examples of ways in which human behavior is influenced by um, external factors. And so it, it looked to me like, well, there are two inferences that are questionable, right? So there's the influence from, there's the inference from some influence to determination, right? That is, so if you can list something that influences human behavior or many things that influence human behavior, therefore human behavior is completely predetermined, right? Because I take it the determinist view is not just that things influence our behavior, but, you know, there's only one thing, okay. And then I just don't think that that's a, um, cogent inference. And then the second thing that I thought was questionable is, um, I would call sort of inference from the bad case to the good case, right? because most of the examples of, um, of influence are cases where there's something going wrong, right? So like there's a person who has a psychiatric disorder, um, uh, and then, you know, and then they do some weird thing that you're not supposed to do or whatever, right? Or, um, you know, a milder case, but, you know, they're the judges who um, are less likely to grant parole if they're hungry. In fact, they haven't, they haven't eaten recently. Okay, but, um, you know, what about cases where nothing is going wrong? Right, so, like, it would seem to me that that suggests that if you want the judges to make decisions properly based upon the evidence, you should make sure they're well fed before they make the decision. But that, like, okay, but this doesn't show that nobody ever <laughs> has free will, right? So how do you show that they are not, you know, making their decisions freely and in accordance with the reasons, even in the case where they're, they're well-fed, well-rested, they don't have any psychiatric problems, and, like, everything is going well, right? Uh, okay. Uh, and then I wanted to comment on, I don't know, the long discussion about intuition. Um, so first I want to say, like, the way we use intuition in epistemology is not, it's not just any belief, right? Like not just any belief is an intuition. So like several of the things that Robert mentioned, I don't think that we would call intuitions. Um, the way we usually use it, or I don't know, the way that I use it is, um, 
So it's a type of appearance, which is to say um, it's a state in which it's a type of mental state in which something appears to you to be the case or seems to you to be the case. Uh, and it's one that's um, intellectual and not inferential. Right. So intellectual as opposed to um, based on observation or memory or introspection is based upon uh, thinking about sort of intellectual reflection, uh, but it's not based on reasoning. Okay, like several of the things that Robert mentioned, um, they might have been based on reasoning. I'm not really sure. Okay, but um, but the other thing I want to say, um, well, you know, why should we rely on appearances? Okay, why should we rely on intuitions? Well, the first thing is an intuition is a type of appearance, and I claim that um, all justification is based on appearances. So, like, if somebody says, oh, I don't like intuitions because here are some cases where somebody had false intuitions, um, that person is probably confused because they haven't thought about what their belief system is based on, including the thing that they're saying right then. Right? <laughs> Because there's no, there's no person whose beliefs are not based upon the way things seem to them. There's no, like, how else are you going to form beliefs? Now, it, it is logically possible to form beliefs on something other than appearances. Like, you could form beliefs based on your desires, like what you want to believe. But nobody thinks that that's better, right? Okay, so, like, all of the examples of, um, you know, why we don't have free will, those are all based on appearances, Okay, and furthermore, and like, you know, it takes a while to make this case out thoroughly, but they're also all based on intuitions. They're based partly on sensory appearances, but they're all also partly going to be based on intuitions. Okay, so like, um, you know, you have, you have judgments like, oh, well, a person shouldn't be blamed for um, actions that are due to a brain malfunction. Uh, that's an intuition. Uh, so like, if you don't, Except intuitions, then you know why? Why are you thinking that? Why, why do you think that's true? Right? And it's just like you know, at the at the most simple and basic level, well, logic is based on intuitions, like the the laws of logic. So you know, if you don't accept intuitions. No reason to accept logic in general, right? Um, but, you know, you have intuitions like, um, well, free will is incompatible with determinism. Right, which Robert and I share, but there's a bunch of people out there known as compatibilists who reject that. Right? And you know, it's just going to be like, well, it's either that we have an, an intuition or we have an argument for that, but the argument is going to be based on intuitions. Okay? So it's just like, you know, you're just not going to have a coherent um, belief system without that. Um, I guess then I'll just comment on the bit about determinism being compatible with change. So uh, I didn't read that thing from Searle, which sounds kind of hilarious. But, uh, you know, I don't think determinism is, means that nothing can ever change, but I think it means that, you know, things are either determined to change or they're determined not to change and there's nothing we can do about it. So that does sort of seem to me like, a, I don't know, well, like a hopeless view. <laughs> it's like whatever is going to happen is going to happen. We can't, we have no control over it, right? So. All right. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Okay, and that closes our rebuttal period. Now we'll move into a 20 to 25 minute open discussion period during which um, <clears throat> I will try not to intervene as the moderator and just allow the conversation to flow naturally. So the only reason I would come in, I guess, is if, if somebody starts reaching for the other person's we're, neck. If but, we're abusing each other. Yes. So as long as that doesn't happen, I think you guys... <laughs> can handle it. But uh, maybe let's let Dr. Sapolsky start with uh, his line of questioning, because uh, that's been the pattern so far. Dr. Sapolsky. Well, I think part of what we got here is what I realized I was terrified about this morning when I realized I couldn't sleep being nervous about this, which is we're obviously coming from totally different disciplines and different languages and stuff. Um, like in, in one of your writings, I have, I have a quote, some people today worry that all of our choices are determined by microscopic events in our brains. And the tone was, yeah, right. And my response is, that's my entire universe. That's what people like I study. And I'm sure if I said something like, oh, well, that's just a philosophical question. You would have apoplexy at that point saying like people have killed each other at conferences over 
like minutia about that. Um, so we're in danger here of using very different languages, different orientations, um, with mine obviously being a mechanistic one and yours being a very different one. Um, you bring up what I think is the toughest issue with like trying to make this argument, which is, oh my God, what if people actually started believing there was no free will? That blame and praise and punishment and reward and anything like that makes no sense whatsoever. How are we supposed to function? And my answer is, I haven't a clue. I have no idea, and it's hard as hell, but it will be morally much more in line with how the world works if we have a view that punishment, retribution for its own sake, never makes sense, and being nicer to one human than another one because in some way their actions have entitled them to be viewed more positively simply doesn't make sense. I don't know how we're supposed to live. And like, I'm just sitting here saying this stuff. Uh, we've got some hints about some of the scariest things that people think would happen if we stop believing in free will actually won't happen. Um, but just because God knows what the world is supposed to look like doesn't change how things work. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. Like, um, you know, if we, if we reject free will, do we have to stop punishing people? And now, you know, one of my flippant responses is no, because like, we're just going to do what we're determined to do. So, you know, if we keep punishing people, that will just mean that we were determined to punish people and we can't be criticized for that because it's not our fault. <laughs> Even if we know that it's, you know, it's not the criminal's fault, but we still punish them anyway. <laughs> we, that's not our fault. So. Um, okay, but you know, we, we will be making a mistake. Um, like I think most determinists would say, well, it's not exactly that you can't punish people. It's that you shouldn't, um, it's that you would get rid of the retributive rationale for punishment, but there could still be a deter deterrence rationale. All right. So we'll continue to punish people just to make them stop doing it. And now I have an example that's supposed to show that, um, this isn't good reasoning. All right, so imagine that there is a crime that's been committed, which is, you know, high profile. A lot of people are outraged about it. Okay, and, um, you know, the government can't find the person who actually did it. But what they can do is they can find an ex-con who was recently released, and they can say that he did it and frame him and then punish him. Okay, and they have no evidence that that person actually did it. Okay, but he has done bad things before. <laughs> so... Okay, and so would that be would that be a good thing to do? <laughs> okay, now without without a retributive rationale, that's equally good as punishing the actual criminal. Right? Because first of all, it will deter people because you'll convince the public that that's the person who did it. So they will now see people who commit who person who they think committed a crime getting punished, so they'll be deterred. Also, this person, the reason why he's an ex-convict is that ex-convicts are at risk of recidivism, just like the person who actually committed the crime. <laughs> right? This person is also at risk of committing a crime in the future. So the incapacitation rationale also applies equally well, right? But, you know, most people's reaction is, no, no, you cannot do that, right? All right, uh, sorry, I think you're muted. I agree. I hope people shouldn't do that um, because, I mean, at first glance, that's this sort of utilitarian argument, like screw up this one person and, and nonetheless you accomplish the societal good of making crime less likely and people will feel justice has been served or whatever. And what I understand to be a problem where people say, oh my God, utilitarian, if you think that way, you're going to wind up just grabbing somebody and throwing them in jail just because like people will feel better and they're totally innocent in this scenario. But you have to have a deep utilitarianism, which says, okay, 
So we now have a sort of society where you can take an innocent person and jail them as follows. And is that for the common good? Yeah. And maybe we should have a sort of society where we take a healthy person and euthanize them because their organs will save this many people's lives. That's a good utility. And somewhere along there, the slippery slope issue, when you look at the implications, the trouble with most circumstances where it seems like, oh, well, this appalling utilitarian conclusion makes sense is because you're looking through a narrow time window. When you make stark decisions like that, you need to see what the long-term consequences are because what you usually conclude from that is, no, actually, it's not for everyone's good that we're able to get away with throwing innocent people in jail just because somebody will think justice was done. So I, I have some issues with that. Oh, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure if I was completely clear on why I was giving that example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's supposed to show that you need retributivism. Right? So like uh, most people will have the reaction that it's okay to punish the person who actually did it, but not the ex-convict who didn't do it. And so that's, that can only be explained by the retributivist rationale. And then, now, so you suggested, well, maybe there's like a more long-term consequentialist reasoning. Like if we do this in general, maybe um, you know, eventually it will cause lack of confidence in the justice system or something. You know, imagine that this is just one person deciding to do this on one occasion, right? And nobody's gonna find out. And, you know, still seems wrong. Right now, I am, of course, relying on intuition here. But, you know, you tell me how else you're going to make moral judgments, you know, other, other than your intuitions. Well, taking a historical view, um, you just said, okay, we, you need to be retributive. Um, but you don't actually have to be. Uh, 500 years ago, we were trying to figure out like why the water in the well suddenly became contaminated. And we had an interpretation that involved retribution. The lepers did it, so let's burn them at the stake. And this was like a usual judicial sort of route there. Um, or someone had a seizure and we needed to punish them for having slept with Satan. And like retribution is appropriate there. And at some point, people said, oh, no, it's a neurological disease. Oh, toxic mothering wasn't the cause of this person's schizophrenia. Oh, this kid isn't lazy that they can't learn to read. Over and over, what we've done is subtract responsibility, subtract retribution, subtract judgment in the form of blame and resulting punishment, we have learned to subtract those things out. And not only hasn't the roof caved in, because we no longer believe that people with epilepsy are demonically possessed, not only hasn't the roof caved in, we have made for a more humane world. The notion of responsibility is a stake on which lots and lots of people have been burned. Yeah, yeah, good. So, uh, I mean, like, those are um, examples of, you know, uh, false factual judgments, right? So, uh, like, I wouldn't, so, you know, like, burning people at the stake um, because they're witches, like, I would describe the error there. The error there is not believing in retribution. Like, if somebody actually got supernatural powers by intercourse with Satan, then I guess they should be punished. The error there was the factual belief that that actually happened, that just happened. Right? And by the way, if the factual belief was true, then yeah, maybe society would have collapsed because there'd be all these satanic witches going around or whatever. Um, but okay, but anyway, like my, my argument isn't intended to be consequentialist, right? That is, I'm counting on you to just have an intuitive reaction in this case that no, you can't punish this person who didn't do it, right? And it's not because society will collapse. It's just like it's unjust to that person. And then if you have that reaction, then you think, okay, but why do I think it's okay to punish the person who actually did it? And then it's going to have to be because he deserved it or something, right? Uh, so, I mean, 
you know, all the, the examples that you gave, it was fine to, um, to stop being retributive about things that people actually had no control over. But if we stop being retributive about, um, well, the things that I would say we, we have control over, um, you know, that, that would be worse. Except again, with a historical view, you know, go back 500 years and you got somebody who's as liberal as both of us probably are. And you get somebody there who's thoughtful and introspective and they probably belong to NPR at the time and like had a little NPR tote bag and their Hamlet or whatever, a sensible, reflective person. And it simply would have seemed like we cannot have a functioning society if we don't get rid of these witches who have these seizures that prove that that's who they are. Over <laughs> and over, in a sense, the history of scientific insights about behavior has consisted of people saying, oh, I had no idea that had something to do with it. Oh, I, and we've gone from like the world of you really need to subtract out retribution when thinking about people having epileptic seizures. They're not witches to like you're pissed off because the person sitting at the table next to you in the restaurant is chewing with their mouth open and making like loud sounds. And you say, I want to strangle them. Somebody needs to say, and no, no, no. Think about their fetal life and all these things that, you know, we're obviously in a different realm of trying to make sense of this stuff and what retribution can you ask this person to leave the restaurant or even burn them at the stake. But at any yeah. given point, the sense of, oh my God, how are things supposed to work if we subtract out retribution? And if we subtract out praise and reward, this seems unthinkable, unimaginable. Um, and people 500 years from now will view us as just as absurd as the peasants who thought the seizures were caused by Satan and be just as appalled at the decisions that we make. Well, so, I mean, this is sounding to me like a sort of skeptical induction, like people have had a lot of false beliefs in the past, and so we're probably wrong today. But, you know, that, that can't be right. Like, like that's too broad a brush, right? So people were wrong about a lot of things in the past. So, but that doesn't mean that we, we should just like reject any belief that we have today. And we can't do that because like, <laughs> because then what, what are, what is our policy going to be based on? Like, well, we like at any given time, you just have to go on the basis of your best guess as to how the world works. You, right. What's the alternative? And so, and okay. And like, you know, the mistakes that people made in the past, okay, it, it would be a good induction if um, the mistakes people made in the past, like implied or were implied by some belief that people still have today. And then you could say, so this is evidence against that. But I think it's not good. It's just sort of like generalizing, like the, the only similarity is this seems obvious to, to us today. And that thing seemed obvious in the previous century. That's not enough of a similarity, I think. To, yeah. to undermine the current belief. You see what I mean? Like, is it, like if that works, that undermines everything, like every belief that we have, right? Well, that generates, I think, what is ultimately a moral issue, an ethical issue. If you know that the judgments you are making today about who counts as an us and who counts as a them, about who should be allowed you know, sanctuary in your country coming from those people are different from us. These are, these are all decisions. If you were, I think by now, morally obliged not to fall into, well, I mean, that's how we know the world works at this point. We know how aspects of the world work. We know a lot of the science. Um, and you bring up, I think, a great counter argument where you said, just because you can show that this has an influence, it doesn't mean that influences like that explain everything. 
if I'm paraphrasing you correctly. Let me just flip that because that's a little bit of a lack of evidence isn't evidence of lacking sort of argument, which like sends you hurtling into a wall. Let me flip that over and do this in the most in your face possible way. Show me that somebody just did a behavior. And suppose that was due to this, the action of this one neuron, which it really doesn't work that way, but show me that neuron did what it did completely independent of hormone levels last morning, what the person ate today, what the genes are that make up that, that neuron, what developmental adversity was about, which neurons were caused by environment to connect up to this. Show me the neuron made that decision independent of any of those factors. And you've just proven free will. And currently you can't do that. And thus we have exactly the issue you bring up. We can't prove that every single one of these things has enough influence so that there's nothing like free will anymore. Again, proof of absence isn't absence of proof, the two of those getting confused. But I think what we have to do is look at the arc of knowledge and look at the certainty with which we punish people now and the certainty where within our own lifetimes, there's been oh, I had no idea biology had something to do with that, that completely changed the inhumane ways that we treated certain people. And you got to make this argument. Like when I went through all those factoids before a study showing smells and a study showing fetal environment, all of that, 95% of those findings came in the last 50 years. 60% of those findings came in the last 25 years. Probably 40% of those findings came in the last five years. And you either have to make an argument that tonight at midnight, somehow we're done. There's going to be no more science. Like nobody's ever going to find out anything else. And you'll be right at that point if you say, nonetheless, we can't predict who's going to like chew loudly with their mouth open or who's going to be a mass murderer. We don't have perfect predictability. But you sit at this juncture and the show me a neuron that functioned independent of any of the influences that we know about now. And that can't be done. And you know that what making that mistake has often done is produced wildly inhumane practices of making people feel responsible for what they're not responsible for, or equally inhumane in terms of the damage caused, making people feel they're entitled to better treatment because of things they actually didn't have any control over. Yeah, now, you know, I'm tempted to, um, to say, you know, you're trying to make us feel bad about things that we're not responsible for, right? Because all of those inhumane things, nobody was responsible for those either. So, um, okay. But to your, I I guess, larger point, like, you know, can we scientifically prove the existence of free will or determinism? So like in principle, um, it could be proved, I guess, you know, one way or the other. (laughs) So like if we had a perfect model of the brain and then, you know, based upon whatever, quantum mechanics, you know, you, you know, you solve the Schrodinger equation for an entire brain or something. And so that you could give predictions of what, uh, what a person would do in any circumstance, you know, and then we could just test whether it's hundred percent accurate in predicting. And if it was, then that would support determinism. And if it wasn't, that would support free will. I guess I wouldn't prove free will, but you know, could, okay. But it would still be, still be pretty good. Uh, Okay, but then so then I think the question is okay, so we haven't we haven't scientifically proven either, but you know what should be the default position? And my claim is well, the default position should be that everything is the way it appears. You know, like I start by assuming things are the way they seem, unless um, until proven otherwise. Right? So 
Uh, so I start and, you know, it just seems like I have free will. So I'm going to start with that, you know, unless I have compelling evidence against it. And so. But again, that's led us in some really bad directions. It just seemed like some races are inferior to other races. It just seemed like it's okay for kids to be worked to death in factories with child labor. It's okay for people to be allowed to like beat their horses to death if the horse isn't pulling their like stock to the market quickly enough in 1823 sort of thing. And then we completely changed our thinking about that. And every single one of those involved making the world like a more humane place. Now, yeah, yeah. in the face of, well, again, the, this, this intuitionism, um, I mean, you know, like all of the, all of the moral progress that has occurred has been because of our moral intuitions, right? Like, you know, how do we figure out that, you know, you shouldn't oppress people <laughs> like, well, that was all based upon, you know, moral reasoning based on our intuition. So like all the good things and all the bad things, because all of our beliefs, you know, all of our moral beliefs come from intuition. So the good ones as well as the bad. This is true. Um, but then you have ways of mechanistically showing what things are more than intuitions and which are solely that and incorrect intuitions. You throw a molecule into somebody's brain and if it's the right molecule, that person will hear voices and believe they've just had, you know, an ecstatic religious experience because it's a certain type of euphoria and hallucinogen or whatever. You intervene and you make a government more stable. And over the next 50 years, people have fewer kids and go to church less often because they're sources of saw. You intervene and you can test and see which intuitions actually are accurate or not. And I think like a theme over and over is like intuitions can really and over and over have led you down a wrong path. I mean, my, my entire like world consists of like, you take a test tube and you take a pipette and you take up some fluid and you put it into another test tube and you do the most unintuitive thing on earth. You believe there's little tiny things in there that you can't see. And that by moving that, that could explain something about that's ridiculous. That's the most, counterintuitive things like continents move around that's ridiculous or unintuitive things like we can say something about when our son is going to die and you know at any given juncture i think the challenge isn't to decide there's no free will whatsoever because you're right it can never be proven. There's no way to prove that there is no God kind of thing. But at any given juncture to recognize that we have demonstrated already that there's so much less free will in domains that really, really matter, that's incumbent upon every one of us to reflect real hard at our current values and know that almost certainly they will be radically transformed by knowledge a century from now or a week from now and question our views about responsibility and blame as a result. Yeah, good. So, um, I mean, again, I think like you might be using intuitions differently for me because, you know, when you describe how people could test their intuitions, I would say you could test empirical hypotheses, but like, you know, there's, there's no way of testing, like moral statements in general, right? So I, I told you we're using different vocabularies. Um, but anyway, and then like, you know, some of these scientific theories that you said were counterintuitive, like I guess atomic theory and continental drift, counterintuitive. Uh, I, I guess I don't find them counterintuitive, but I guess, uh, um, but the, what are they based upon? Well, so, okay, in some way, like they're all based on intuitions, right? And 
By that, I don't mean you just think about the theory and just intuitively see that it's true. No, I mean somebody engaged in a process of reasoning by which they got to atomic theory. Okay, but that process of reasoning used their intuitions at various points, right? So, you know, you have things like, well, I don't know, I have the intuition that the simplest explanation of something is most likely to be true. <laughs> right? And it's not like we believe atomic theory because it's counterintuitive. It's, it's like, no, <laughs> um, you know, we believed it because actually it was the most intuitive thing that actually explained the evidence, right? Uh, so, you know, like, oh, uh, explains Brownian motion, okay? But, you know, like, uh, that's an observed phenomenon, but then also, you know, like, you need mathematical premises, right? And then you need sort of, like, theory confirmation assumptions, like, simplest theory is probably most likely to be true or something like that. And parsimony, an awful lot of people have been, like, cut by Occam's razor of saying parsimony is the way to go because it's a very nature, it's not the nature of nature to be simple and straightforward and natural roundabouts or whatever, and even in the realm that most challenges intuitionism, um, like quantum indeterminacy, you, you've pointed out what's exactly the case, which is the majority of physics physicists now believe in it, rather than there's multiple worlds or there's a missing variable or anything like that. But it's all summarized by Richard Feynman famously saying, if you think you understand quantum indeterminacy, you don't understand quantum indeterminacy. Um, nonetheless, that appears to be how the world works. Intuition and clearly the imprecise way in which I'm using it gets into trouble over and over again. And in our place and time now, our belief systems lead us to perceive responsibility and causality in domains where our attributions are simply wrong and it makes for a meaner world. Okay. Um, are we supposed to be like taking questions from the audience at this point? Or yes. So what, can we try to wrap up the open discussion and then uh, take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. In fact, yeah, we can just do it now. If, okay. All right. So um, thank you so much. That, that was a fantastic debate. I've, I really enjoyed it. That was extremely interesting. And both speakers gave uh, very uh, challenging uh, arguments for their views. Let's see. So, we, but why don't we, okay. So we've got a number of questions from the audience. One question is to Dr. Humer, um, is there such a thing as partial determination of a choice you say free choices can be influenced, but that doesn't make them wholly determined. But what does that mean? Is there like a 50, 50% breakdown of free versus influenced in the case of the smelly garbage, making people more aversive to homosexuality, as Dr. Spolsky pointed out, uh, what would that even mean? I don't exactly know. Um, so, you know, it seems like there are things that influence your decision, things outside of you influence your decision, including you know, some things that you're not aware of influencing you. Um, it just seems like that's true. How it works, I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, what it means that it influences but doesn't determine it is, I suppose, that it makes it more likely that you make one decision rather than the other. Um, but, um, you know, try to, like, if you try to think about how that works, I don't know. Uh, you know, if you think introspectively, um, sometimes it's harder to make a decision than other times. Like sometimes you feel like it's easy to to do the th whatever, it's easy to make a decision. Other times it seems like it's hard. Um, and that probably has something to do with how strong the outside influences are, right? Um, so I just want to say like, well, okay, there are at least some cases in which it's easy to do what you want to do or whatever. And then, you know, at least sometimes you have free will, right? And, right, but I don't, I'm like, have like an explanation of, I don't know, like, what does it mean that it's more difficult, right? <laughs> like, you can have that experience, right, of it being difficult to decide to do something, but I don't really have a deeper explanation of what's going on. Okay, this question is to both panelists. Um, could it be that part of the reason for the difference between Dr. Sapolsky and Dr. Humor's views 
is that scientific practice presupposes determinism because it seeks explanations. That is, can you explain a free choice or is a free choice by definition a brute fact? Oh yeah, that's good. Uh, oh, sorry, do you want to go there? No, nah, go for it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so does, does science presuppose determinism? Well, no, there are indeterministic theories like quantum mechanics, so that's scientific and it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, but also, you know, it seeks explanations for things. Well, yeah, there are explanations. Like I, I would say there are explanations that are not deterministic, but you could like cite, you could explain somebody's behavior by citing their reasons for it, which I, I don't think implies determinism. Um, that I, I'm feeling like I'm forgetting part of the question there. Uh, um, wait, I'm trying to find oh, the ahead. question in the chat here, but I, I, Go ahead, yeah. agree. scientific explanations for how things happen are not synonymous with predictability. And you cite one great example, quantum indeterminacy. Another one, which is like beyond trendy now, but was once like unthinkable, is chaoticism. Is the scientific world where you demonstrate that deterministic systems are by nature unpredictable. There are some of them like that. And that doesn't make it like unscientific. It's chaotic systems work scientifically. They work in a deterministic way, but like science doesn't equal predictability in a case like that. And yeah, I, I totally agree. They're not synonymous. Oh, yeah, so I wanted to say like, I think the other part of the question is sort of like when somebody makes a free choice can you explain why they did that choice rather than another? And then, um, I don't know. I mean, you can sort of explain it because you can say what their reason was, right? But then somebody could ask, okay, but why did they act on that reason rather than these other reasons that would support a different choice? And so there's some point in there where I think there is no explanation, right? There's some point where it's just, well, that's just what they decided to do. Whereas my view would be at no point does that occur. There's always a, because of what happened before, because of what happened before. And as long as we keep dancing around this way, why does a quantum of determinacy prove free will? Because that's a completely, that violates what I just said. And some really cogent, well, that the micro world of quantum indeterminacy has no capacity whatsoever to maintain its state up to the level of influencing one molecule, let alone one person or one society. It's simply, it's simply impossible that it works that way. But anyway, yes, that separate of that point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this question is for Dr. <laughs> Sapolsky. Um, Dr. Sapolsky, how would you account for some mammals evolving to have emotions about things that don't actually contribute to our ongoing existence? Uh, for example, what is the evolutionary reason for us to feel gratitude towards someone who helps us if there is no reason to feel that way, i.e. people don't have a choice to help? Hmm. Well, if you're a game theory type, you can talk about the evolution of gratitude because it enhances reciprocity and it rewards people for their altruistic actions to you. And that winds up being more adaptive in certain circumstances. And, you know, the whole world of game theory is applied to animal behavior and human behavior and evolution. In cases like that, though, where does gratitude come from? So let's redefine that. Okay, let's not do that on this distal level of how did this evolve? Let's do it on this much more proximal level of like, how does the brain produce gratitude? And you can figure out why one person feels more gratitude than another with the knowledge we have these days. It would almost certainly involve like taking their brain out and slicing it up on a table and compare it to somebody else's. So it's not possible to actually do that, but you can explain why that's the case at a proximal level. And then you could explain it at the level of, because by the time you throw enough neurons together, you get emergent things like philosophy and aesthetics and theology and stuff like that, multiple levels of explanation, but like, 
you could make sense of where that comes from. Okay, uh, we have a question for both panelists. Um, starting with Dr. Sapolsky, why aren't you just a compatibilist? Why do you go so far as to call yourself a hard determinist? Um, because I don't think there is any way in which any view of what free will consists of in the thinking of any contemporary or historical philosopher that is not ruled out by what we know about how behavior and the underlying biology and environmental influences work. But again, I emphasize, I'm like, talk about insane. I am so far out on the lunatic fringe of hard incompatibilists in that I think there is no room whatsoever for free will to make any sense of what we're doing. You don't have to be convinced. I'm perfectly happy with somebody concluding that there is so much less free will than we at present intuit to be the case that we better think about some of the most damaging things that we do in our lives, like who we blame and who we reward and who we punish. Yeah, good. Should I comment on why I'm not a compatibilist? I would say, um, you know, if I became convinced that determinism was true, then I would become a compatibilist first <laughs> before I'd be a hard determinist. Right. So, and why? I don't know. Like, um, you know, here's a general thing that I think, like, we form concepts to um, group together things in the world that seem similar to us. And so when you're analyzing a concept, um, it shouldn't turn out that, you know, all of the things that you learn the concept by looking at actually don't, it doesn't apply to, right? So like, you know, like, why do we have the concept of knowledge? Well, there are these cases where like people have some mental state and we notice something about that mental state that's distinctive, you know, and like it shouldn't, when you analyze what knowledge means, your analysis should not make it turn out that every paradigm example of somebody knowing something is actually a case of ignorance, right? There's some, something has gone wrong. Like that's not the way you should be doing philosophy or whatever. So when I think about what free will is, I want to, I want to give a description that sort of captures um, the things that people paradigmatically call doing something of your own free will. Right. And so, okay. And so like, you know, if it turns out that, um, all of those are actually predetermined by antecedent causes, then I would say, okay, I guess. All right, however, okay, so then, you know, that makes the question more pressing. So why am I not in fact a compatibilist? Like, well, there are some, you know, just arguments against compatibilism that seem pretty, pretty intuitive, so to speak. Okay, <laughs> so I give this example sometimes like, um, okay, so let's say that a student comes to me near the end of the semester and says, hey, Mr. Humor, because, you know, these, Freshmen often think that you're Mr. <laughs> hey, Mr. Humor, uh, how can I get an A in your class, right? And then I look at the grade book and I say, well, okay, so in order to get an A in the class, you would have to have gotten at least an 87% average on the first four tests. And actually your average was 75. What do you think I'm implying there? <laughs> what can they infer? And now they should infer that they can't get an A in the class. And now what this illustrates is if in order for you to do X, something would have to have happened in the past that did not happen, then you can't do X. And like that seems really, that seems like a pretty compelling principle, okay? If determinism is true, then in order for you to do anything other than what you actually do, you know, it would always be that something would have to have happened in the past that didn't happen, right? So then that means you can never do anything other than what you actually do. Right. And then I just take it like that, obviously, is incompatible with what we think of free will as being. So, Okay, but, you know, like if I became convinced determinism was true, then I would have to think there was something wrong with that argument. <laughs> Even though it seems really intuitive, maybe, maybe it's wrong. Well, maybe some of it reflects a narrow window on your part and that there's not the possibility of the student bribing you. Right, yeah. Well, I'm stipulating, right? So stipulate that what I said is true, right? <laughs> right, which was that you would have to have gotten the 87% average. So stipulate that that's true and that they didn't get it. You know, then they can't get it. 
Okay. Um, can we take two more questions? All right. Um, okay. So Caleb asks, uh, Dr. Humer, with respect to your second argument, are we really choosing whether or not to believe in free will or a hard determinism? More generally, do we choose any of our beliefs? Couldn't Dr. Sapolsky just be a doxastic and voluntarist who thinks, uh, who holds the view that you can't choose your beliefs? Yeah, good. Um, so, like, there's a long discussion we had about that. Um, the, so, the doxastic involuntarists think that you know you you don't have any control over your beliefs anyway. That is, even if we have free will in general, you still don't choose beliefs. And then part of why they say that is they give examples like, hey, you know, try believing that you're a giraffe, and you know you you find yourself unable to do it. <laughs> okay, but the examples I think are usually unconvincing because they're usually examples of things that um, you have basically conclusive evidence against. So they only show that you're unable to believe things that are obviously false, but they don't show that you're unable to control your beliefs in cases like this where there isn't conclusive evidence. Okay, and then, all right, but anyway, okay, well, I think that we're choosing our beliefs. And then, well, my claim is that this whole reasoning process where you're trying to figure out, you know, whether to believe in determinism or not, that that's a kind of deliberation um, and by the way, like the, the fact that you can't um, just choose to believe that you're a giraffe, I think that's analogous to the fact that, you know, you can't choose to perform um, ordinary actions that you have conclusive reasons against. Right? So like, you know, think about um, going to the top of the building and just jumping off for no reason. Can you do that? And then like, it does kind of seem like you can't do that, <laughs> but... You can't do that while having no reason to do it and having conclusive reason not to do it. Okay, but that's not usually taken to show that you don't control your actions, right? And so if you give an example where you can't believe something that you have conclusive reason to reject and no reason to believe, like that doesn't really show that you have less control over your beliefs than your actions, right? Um, you know, when you're deliberating about what to do, there's this practice of re weighing reasons for and against. And I think that's analogous to when you're reasoning, the pra the um, weighing reasons for and against a particular belief, right? So it kind of looks to me like it's a, um, a choice process. Okay, final question. Um, oh, I just lost it, hold on. Okay, um, Dr. Humor, why can't Dr. Sapolsky help himself to alternative accounts of what should and reason mean? Uh, maybe they just mean it would be better if someone did such and such thing. They don't imply the existence of alternative possibilities. And finally, why can't our beliefs be deterministically caused by good epistemic reasons? So even though they, we, we have no choice about our beliefs, they still follow the evidence. They just do so in a deterministic way. Well, first I would just say, no, that's not what should means. All right, so, you know, take my example of the Star Trek episode where Q says, yeah, just change the gravitational constant of the universe. Okay, now you imagine um, Commander Data says, well, that's not within our capabilities. And now Q says, yeah, I know, but you should still do it anyway, right? Don't you agree with that? Obviously. And then, okay, so if should just means it would be better if you did, then it's true. <laughs> then Q could say, yes, you should change the gravitational constant. Um, okay, but I take it like that's obviously not correct. That's not how we use the word should, and you wouldn't want to use it that way, right? Like, and Okay, and if that was what it meant, then it just wouldn't have the role that it has, where like somebody wants advice, and then you tell them what, what you should do, right? Then you could just like say, yeah, you know, what you should do is like bring about world peace, you know, and like make everyone immortal and like whatever. Um, okay. Now I feel like there was another part of the question that I've forgotten. Um, okay. So the second part was, I think um, you made, you made a, so one of your arguments against Dr. Sapolsky's determinism was that it's incoherent because, or, or that it's self-defeating because it implies that he can't believe determinism for good reasons. Oh, Instead, he has to reasons. believe it deterministically, but why couldn't yeah. he be deterministically caused by good re good epistemic reasons to believe what he believes? Maybe he yeah, follows yeah, yeah. the evidence by 
uh, yeah. a preordained as a preordained outcome. Yeah. So I think this is in response to the J.R. Lucas quote. And I myself had a little trouble figuring out what J.R. Lucas's argument was, right? Because he's like, oh, you can't, <laughs> you can't take their arguments as being really arguments. Why not? <laughs> but anyway, um, this was what I could what I could gather, or I don't know, this was my interpretation. Um, he's not thinking about just determinism in general. He's thinking about a specific brand of determinism where what determines what you do is always like microphysical events, right? So it's a bunch of electrical and chemical reactions in your brain. And then the assumption is those things are not responsive to um, epistemic reasons, right? So like, they're, like, like the molecules in your brain don't know what truth is and they can't respond to the property of truth or the property of being a good reason or anything like that, even if those things exist, right? And so, yeah. All right, and with that, we have our debate on whether free will exists and does it matter? Uh, thank you so much to our panelists, Dr. Humer and Dr. Spolsky. It's been wonderful. Uh, an audience member says, thank you all for doing this. Um, so it was great to see both of you come together. They had, okay, yeah. Well, then they, then I agree with that sentiment. Um, I really appreciate it. Please, uh, so I'm gonna stop the recording now. Please stay on for the, like, I, I don't think, I think you should only take like 20 seconds, but just stay until it says upload complete. So.